Yes, sir. We are live. We can start, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Rohit from Medical Affairs Team at Dr. Reddy's Lab. And on behalf of uh, entire Dr. Reddy's family, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to this national CME on current concept on role of aviparavir in managing COVID-19. And to deliberate this topic uh, and to lecture on, on this particular topic, uh, we are very privileged and fortunate to have with us an authority, I would say, uh, in, in currently in, in the managing paradigm of COVID-19, uh, Dr. Sanju Mehta. So Dr. Sanju Mehta needs no introduction. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, we all know that he's, he's one of the senior most uh, 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 chess physician in the country, has more than 26 years of experience, is trained in Rhode Island Hospital and Tufts University in the United States, has also lectured at Rhode Island Hospital and West Virginia University. He is a recipient of Dr. C. V. Ramakrishna uh, Ramakrishnan uh, from the Indian Chess Society. Uh, he is also chairing the Council of Global Governors of American College of Chess Physicians. He has delivered multiple lectures in various countries, which includes it, but not limited to the United States, the European Union, the Asia Pac region. Is the only speaker from India at the first and second Chess World Conference and has numerous publications uh, to his credit and as well as has authored uh, multiple chapters in the textbook. So with this uh, brief introduction, I would hand over the, the session to Dr. Sanjeev Mehta. Sir, uh, privilege and honor to have you, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Rohit. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to discuss this topic. It's also extremely special because we are going to uh, talk about a new, uh, a new drug uh, for this uh, dreaded pandemic, and so uh, such a pleasure to have so many people in the audience. I'd like to thank you for inviting me. I'd like to thank uh, DRL, Dr. Eddies, for arranging this program and hosting it. So thank you all. Those words, let me uh, try to share my screen and let's start the presentation. So... So we all have faced COVID uh, like nothing else, nothing else before. This is the, the first pandemic of our lifetimes. You have to have one, maybe two lifetimes to see this kind of devastation. The last time the world saw a devastation like this was probably the Second World War. And uh, really, it is the World War. Hello, can you hear yeah, me? Sir. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, sir. We I had lost you in between. Is everything okay right now? Yeah, sir. Yes, we can right now, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. So, uh, sir, you have to screen, share screen again. You have to share Anji? your screen. Sir, you have to screen, uh, share your screen again. Your, uh, okay, screen okay, okay. Again. I'll share my screen again. Okay. Uh, So the coronaviruses have been with us for a long time and starting with a common cold. Uh, but sometimes because of a shift in the antigen uh, presentation, uh, these viruses can cause severe disease. 
Now, we have been familiar with that. The first was the SARS virus. Uh, there was a very large uh, or significant amount of damage caused in mainly uh, East Asia. And then we had the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which was again a coronavirus, which caused a fair amount of deaths. In fact, the highest case fatality ratio was in the MERS virus uh, seen in the Middle East. And now we have something new, and that is the latest one, which is the COVID-19 or the coronavirus disease that started in 2019 uh, that has come on to us. It started in China, it's now a pandemic, and it's affected all parts of the world. Uh, this is one crazy uh, virus, because you can see that uh, it only started in 2019 and nothing has progressed so fast uh, than this virus. And so it is spread to all over the world. At this moment, uh, as of the last few days, the total number of patients affected are 21 million individuals have been affected. Uh, total number of deaths are 7.7 .7 lakhs across the world. Uh, we in India have had 27 uh, uh, lakh individuals affected with 51,900 uh, deaths. And I think last two days, we've had the maximum number of cases ever reported in 24 hours, uh, I think nearly 60,000, and we've had massive number of deaths. Uh, Mumbai was the epicenter uh, to start with. Uh, it is now spread across India. Uh, the speed at which uh, these cases have spread, you can see that we had very little at the beginning, but it just went up, up, and up, and up, and the flat curve hasn't really flattened. Only yesterday it was expected that the peak will come uh, in early or middle of September. So this is what we are having to deal with, and this is now upon every one of us. Every one of us is going to see COVID patients, and so it is good to be prepared to deal with it. So this is the coronavirus. Uh, I hope you can see the picture. You can see that there are these, this is the virus. These are the viruses. It is a single stranded RNA virus. But what do you see over here? You see, it has these very, very hazy edges. Shall I say sh pointed edges? Okay. And this is what it looks like. I'm sorry, I have to take this call. This is from the hospital. And I have some COVID. Thing. Hello. Yeah, I'm on a conference call. Uh, hello. Can... I'm on a, I'm a web conference. Let me call you. So can you please call me in one hour? Apologize, but you see that as soon as the patient gets admitted, my team informs me and we start a drug which I'm going to talk to you about. So that's real life practice for, for all of us. Okay, so this is the virus and the virus has these pointed objects at the surface, which is giving it the shape of a corona. Corona is the shape of the sun with these rays coming out, especially during an uh, eclipse. And you will see these rays coming out. So this is what gives this virus a name, the coronavirus. Now, uh, these, it, uh, these objects, which are called the spike proteins, are extremely important. The reason they become important is because the spike proteins help in attaching the virus to the human cell. Now, if it did not have these spike proteins, it cannot attach to the human cell. It attaches to the ACE2 receptor. As soon as it gets attached here, it gets internalized. Once the virus is internalized, it takes over the human host and then starts making more and more virus copies. So this spike protein is key in the pathogenesis of uh, the coronavirus. 
And the reason I'm telling you that is because this has impact on the internalization, but this is also the target of our new vaccines and uh, which will hopefully be able to beat this uh, disease. Now, while the COVID-19 infection starts lung, it affects nearly every organ of the body. And uh, so most people will get extensive lung damage, but we are seeing so much of damage to the heart that practically every serious patient of mine has got some kind of an acute coronary event or heart failure. So it damages the heart significantly. AKI is an extremely common event uh, or acute kidney injury in the seriously ill patients. Not everybody, but in the seriously ill patients. And so is brain injury. Uh, so we know that many people get uh, GI disturbances, but the important, one, important ones are the brain, the lungs, the heart, uh, the kidney, and of course, uh, every organ can be involved. We've seen that the lungs, the heart, eyes, nose, uh, change in taste. A lot of them get, half of them get elevation in liver enzymes, kidney and the intestine. But what is become extremely important is this, that the SARS-CoV virus having bound to the ACE in, uh, receptor sets up in what is called as an arteritis and an inflammation in the vessel lining. This creates clots in the blood. So when it causes white clots, it can cause uh, thrombosis. When it causes red clots, it can cause DVT with pulmonary embolism. And so therefore, and that has impact on treatment because you got to prevent both the arterial and the venous clots. In children, there's an extensive clot related disease uh, much like a Kawasaki, it's a systemic inflammatory response, much like a Kawasaki, and um, that can cause extensive damage. So while we in India have 27 lakh confirmed cases, the good news is that 19 lakh cases are fully recovered. The bad news is that we've had about 21,000 uh, deaths, 51,000, probably by now 52,000. Now, what I want to draw your attention to as doctors is that while most people recover, remember that many of them are going to be left with late sequelae. And that's why I showed you the previous slides telling you that these sequelae can be in the brain, in the heart, in the kidney. Many of them will require long-term dialysis. But as a pulmonologist, my most important uh, interest is in the lungs because they're going to be long-term pulmonary sequelae. And I, I'm already doing now follow-up PFTs to see what is going to be the changes and how long it will evolve. So I think this is going to be a huge epidemic of lung problems in patients who have recovered. So imagine 19 lakh patients is what has been recorded. I'm quite sure that there'll be more than that. So imagine how many of these patients are going to be uh, late sequelae. And I think there's going to be an epidemic of interstitial lung disease caused by COVID related damage uh, going forward. Some of the other uh, problems are going to be pulmonary hypertension, both because of the lung problem and because of the arterial venous clots. So I think we have a huge problem, which we are going to have to deal with over time. And the epidemic is not even peaked yet. So I don't know how many people we'll have, but that's a problem we'll have to deal with. So the question is, this is the virus, this is the damage does it, it does. So what could be our basis of treating this disease so that we have the least problems? Now, when our patients came to us and we started dealing with the COVID epidemic as early as April this year, uh, when our hospitals became a COVID hospital and Mumbai was hit hard, we had no option. We had to deal with it. So when the patient started coming to us uh, in the beginning, we really did not have much many drugs, one. And secondly, uh, we did not have much therapeutic knowledge. So we used to give every drug immediately to the patient as soon as the patient saw us and um, hope that something will work. We were fortunate that we had the virus four months after the USA had because we had already seen 
some of the medicines that work. Of course, there's confusion. Every day we get new uh, medicines that may or may not work. But what is uh, what is now coming to our understanding is that the virus is multiphasic. The disease is multiphasic. That the initial response, I would say about five days, is the initial viral response. Then, and this is recognized clinically by fever, cough, myalgia, maybe dyspnea. And in the lab, you will get blood tests showing low WBC count, uh, low uh, neutrophil count. You'll also get some elevation of liver enzymes. That's how you recognize the viral phase. The IL-6 and the uh, CRP would be reasonably under well control, including the D-dimer. The next phase is as the virus is going down, the body in that unfortunate patient who gets it, gets a host inflammatory response, which is known as a cytokine storm. So in the beginning, the patient will be short of breath. Uh, this is the time when we're going to start to see those early ground glass opacities and interstitial changes, which CT scan people will tell us is compatible with the viral pneumonia, given the clinical context, COVID pneumonia or COVID pneumonitis. The liver enzymes are going to start rising at this time as the inflammatory response comes in. And finally, once a, a virus is out actually by that time, the ARDS and the septic shock sets in and the patient will have uh, a very difficult outcome. So these are the phases, uh, I would say uh, about five days each. And so the disease, if it is not creating problems in the first 15 days, you can rest assured this guy is going to be okay. But for the most part, five, 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 and 15 days will tell us which way your patient is heading. Now that helps us in treatment strategies, because if you see the first part, which is uh, the pure viral phase, this patient does not need to go uh, into hospital. He's got really a little bit of cough, body ache, and this patient can be managed uh, either at home or OPD, but of course, he or she would be quarantined. So this patient is going to be at home, not in a hospital, but under your expert guidance, under your expert supervision. So this patient is going to be home. Now, what we need to do is target this early phase. This phase is when the virus has just got in, is actively multiplying, is replicating and growing rapidly. Now, if we can target this virus at, th at this time, if we can target the virus at this time with a good antiviral agent, we are hoping that we will be able to achieve viral clearance because if we can kill the virus, it will go away. If we can stop its reproduction, if there's less virus, there'll be less symptoms, minimal contagiousness, so it won't spread the disease to everybody and hopefully prevent all the bad outcomes by preventing the progression to severe disease because the viral load itself is less. So, and so the question is, can this be done? So yes, it can be done. And uh, fortunately, while we have two um, antivirals available with us, the one which is the best studied in the OPD patients, because this is gonna be say 99% of your patients are gonna be outpatients. Uh, and I have families of them taking this drug uh, at home because it's now available. So, uh, well, it was started in the, this is a Japanese product known as Avigan in uh, Japan. Uh, and now it's come to India. Uh, its mechanism of action is interference with the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which in turn inhibits the viral transcription so this is what it does. So if the virus gets in from here, it will uncoat, it will start to do protein synthesis. For this, it needs RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So this single stranded virus will make copies of itself. And what favipiravir does is it blocks the RDRP, that is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Because it does that, it can prevent the replication of the virus and 
preventing its spread and having all the good effects which I just told you in the previous slide. This drug has uh, been approved in the following indication in the following dose. Uh, it's a 200 milligram tablet. You give nine tablets on the first day morning, nine tablets first day evening, followed by four tablets twice a day for about 14 days. Um, I'm going to discuss the duration as I go along. Uh, you'll understand why we give for 14 days. So this looks good in theory, isn't it? This looks fantastic. Uh, we're going to stop the viral replication. Patient is going to be great. Everything is going to be good. But the question is, does it really work? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to share with you some of the in vitro data. Now look, so this is a broad spectrum antiviral uh, and it works against the SARS-CoV-2. Actually, it was started, the study, initial studies I think were done uh, many years ago in Japan and also in the Ebola epidemic in Africa. Well, this slide showing the effect of uh, this Favipiravir on viral replication in the Petri dish. And it has been shown that to suppress 50% of the viral colonies, it shows a very favorable uh, efficacy and a very favorable safety profile. So Favipiravir in the lab at least shows very good effect and uh, in inhibiting the virus and also has a high margin of safety as seen in this uh, initial in this initial study uh, in the Vero six uh, e six cells. So these are the lab data. What does it do to human beings? And now I'm going to show you some of the clinical studies, uh, basis of which it got the approvals in uh, various countries. So there are a bunch of studies. We're going to look at most of these studies. In fact, we look at all of them. But we're going to start with the first one, which is uh, the Japanese study. Now, the Japanese started using this drug uh, the earliest. And these are when patients were given for compassionate use uh, when they had the uh, virus. So 2,000 patients. This is an observational study of all the patients who got the drug to see what were the outcomes, uh, what is the effect and what are the outcomes. So this is a huge study. Uh, 2,000 patients. And the object of the study was to look at the various kinds of patients, how were the doses given, um, and finally, are there adverse effects and the clinical status day 7 to day 14. Now, 2,000 patients, 407 hospitals. Uh, most of the patients were older, as you expect, because younger don't get that symptoms. And most of the patients were 50 years or older. Uh, most of them had, uh, or at least 50% had at least one of the comorbidities. So that's the high-risk group. And you can see this, that in this subgroup, the number of patients that improved were 74 by day 7, but that increased to 88% by day 14. In the mild and the moderate group, you saw between, if you gave the drug more than 7 days, 14 days, then the number of people who get well increased from 74% to 85 to 88%, depending if they were moderate or mild. And this benefit, you can see, is across all ages. In the younger people, uh, improved. In as you get into the older group, it goes down. But again, 95, 95, 90 percent, 93 percent, and then 83 and 84 percent. So this is the way the um, efficacy goes across all ages in these patients, including the elderly, and that's important, including the elderly. So uh, the conclusion of this uh, analysis of real-time data was that Favipiravir, uh, most patients, even if they're older, 88% by day 14 in mild cases, 85% in moderate cases, and it was also increased 
in uh, severe cases. So that is favipiravir in the observational study as such. Now let us see a comparative study. So this is favipiravir versus lopinavir and rotenavir. These were antiretroviral agents uh, that were used uh, in the HIV population and to compare that with favipiravir. So this is a clinical trial. This is done in China. And looking at the safety and most important, efficacy and viral clearance. And you can see here that compared to lopinavir, rotenavir, the favipiravir group showed significant early viral clearance. And this was statistically significant, P less than 0 0.001. So this shows that compared to at least this combination of antivirals, when given favipiravir, the virus clearance is definitely faster, is enhanced, and that difference is significant all through the 14-day study. What's also important is that did the virus go away. The, this patch has cleared away. This patch has gone and this patch is gone. So there is also uh, improvement in the, in the CT scans. So the lungs are also getting better. And you can see that amongst the patients, favipiravir, 91% got better. In the lopinavir, rotanavir group, only 28%. So 91% versus 62%. So clearly, uh, you clear the virus, you get better clinical outcomes and better lung clearance. Okay. And the side effects were much less. So in the favipiravir group, uh, there were only 11% side effects versus the retroviral group, 55%. So this is P less than 0 0.001. So early clearance, better uh, CT scans, less side effects. So this is how it was. Significant shorter median time interval to virus clearance, higher improvement in CT scans, and less side effects in the favipiravir group. Okay, so this is the Russian study that finally got the approval uh, in Russia. So in this study, in 330 patients, viral clearance was seen in four days with the favipiravir group compared to nine days with standard therapy. So here's another study showing early viral clearance with favipiravir, okay? So by day 10, 90% had turned RT-PCR negative. By day four, 65% were already negative. So this shows again, uh, significant uh, viral clearance and also improvement in clinical symptoms like fever resolution by day three versus in standard therapy day six. So because of this early clearance and clinical improvement, this drug was approved in Russia. There's a Bangladesh trial again showing uh, early viral clearance and clinical improvement in that group. So it seems to work. It seems to make a benefit, but what are the risks with this drug? So uh, looking at these studies, and so it's been well studied, 3000 patients were given this drug, 40 clinical studies, phase one, phase two, phase two and phase three, the commonest side effect is hyperuricemia. Uh, we are seeing that in our uh, patient population too. Hyperuricemia is seen in about 15%. Uh, some people have experienced even higher. So please be very careful uh, in, in a patient of gout or if your patient tells you he or she has joint pains, then please look for hyperuricemia. The other bothersome side effect is uh, liver function abnormalities. So we monitor their LFTs when we start this drug. A few people can get diarrhea, uh, rash. Uh, now these are less than 1%. So I don't think these count. You can uh, acute kidney injury, nausea. But again, I think the acute kidney injury is less than with remdesivir. It, uh, it may cause a host of other side effects, which are less than 1%. Now what's important is that none of these are permanent. The uric acid increase is reversible. You stop the drug by day 21, everything starts to come back. By end of the month, 
uric acid levels are normal and we have seen that in our patient elevated liver enzymes will also go up by day third third week fourth week and then it will come down again by the end of the month same applies to the other liver enzyme alt uh, and it has a few drug drug interactions such as you don't want to give it pyrazinamide because that also increases uric acid uh, repaglinide repaglinide also will cause it theophylline and some other drugs so you need to be careful it it doesn't interact with the cytochrome p450 so it has no interaction with rifampicin but pyrazinamide it interacts through the uh, increase in uric acid so that's the one you need to be careful with but otherwise very minimum drug drug interaction now so what are the precautions and i'm going to talk to you about this in a bit so hypersensitivity don't give it if somebody is allergic to it somebody who has a severe renal or hepatic impairment no don't give it to pregnant ladies and lactating women but because it has teratogenic effect and affects growth uh, in children so that's something at least in lactating women uh but remember most important it is teratogenic so therefore when you're giving it to a lady please make sure that she has effective contraception now not only at the time of taking the drug but also for 7 days afterwards both in men and women so it is secreted in the uh, sperm and it can affect the it can affect the uh, sperm uh, and can create teratogenicity both in the male and the female for 7 days after stopping the drug so please keep that in mind okay so where do you place this then so for the most part in your patients who are suffering from mild to moderate disease those who are not in the hospital those who are at home those who are not taking the an intravenous and in the early stage i would you we would use favipiravir because it's oral uh, it's something you can give to the patient uh, obviously it's hospitalized that would be the time one would look at giving an intravenous antiviral drug So these are my concluding slides. In patients with mild to moderate uh, COVID-19 infection, we would use uh, this drug because of the following, and I've established that in the studies: rapid viral clearance, which may reduce the spread because it's gone, and prevent progression of illness. So it has a patient benefit and community benefit. Rapid symptom resolution has been demonstrated. uh ct scan improvement has been demonstrated and clinical recovery uh going on to day 14 has been demonstrated so clearly lot of benefits by using this drug and you already heard me uh, uh get a call from a hospital the patient has been admitted and as soon as the patient gets admitted to hospital uh favipiravir was started immediately i didn't put it on that was actually all natural and all of this will reduce healthcare cost because patients are not going to uh, suffer that much hopefully till the time we have an effective vaccine maybe this is one of the pictures we got we all got used to seeing this and this is a picture from the 1918 spanish flu pandemic with that i'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, i hand you back to dr rohit and see if he can if there are any questions that i can help you with um So what do you know? Should I stop screen uh, sharing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. I think I'm on time. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, sir, for this excellent uh, lecture. You have covered uh, the the entire uh, you know landscape of uh, why to treat, when to treat, how to treat, what are the right dose, what is the right duration, and also talked about the safety aspect and the precaution aspect associated with the use of pavitravir. So with that, there are a couple of questions, sir. So I'll just put it across to you. Sure. Uh, yeah. So there is a question that patient is clinically, uh, no, appear to be mild, having just pe pe symptoms of fever and dry cough, 
but uh, chest x ray shows and X hrct shows that there is bilateral pneumonia uh, and throat swab is negative so what is to be done in such patients yeah so this is a very common problem uh, thank you it's a very important question because we all see it all the time um so because there is a 70% sensitivity of the rt pcr one would keep it in mind but i would go by the hrct scan findings i want you to however bear a few things in mind even the hrct is not infallible now but if the patient has the symptoms as a clinical context so i have many patients where four members of a family are affected or two members in a family are affected this patient is rt pcr negative but then has fever or clinical features that suggested then given the clinical context of the patient i would go by the ct scan i would give more weightage to the ct scan and if you feel that there are some changes like this then maybe you could start the therapy now that brings me to another important point you see up until now the only available modality for us for mild patients was quarantine so the patient had fever but we had nothing to give if many of you will remember that in the swine flu and other fevers we have been giving oseltamivir to the all the family members of the of that uh, patient now i am not recommending that we give it to everybody but now there is an option so if you had a family member of this individual case which you just showed me dr rohit that the patient uh, has uh, some fever some changes even if his rt pcr negative if some of the early uh, other family members had it there is circumstantial evidence to support it then i would not only leave i would not leave this patient alone but i would offer them early therapy with an effective antiviral which we now have okay so i hope that puts i hope that helps you uh, op- help you understand that reply and how to deal with it uh, the one more interesting question sir regarding the start of fevipiravir so as you alluded in your lecture that uh, the earlier you start the better it is uh but then the question points out to the you know one one limitation which we have with rt pcr testing they say that uh, even though the patient is clinically suspected to have covid 19 and they do rt pcr test the turnaround time is uh, almost two days in some some centers in india so what is to be done uh, should they wait for the the report to come back uh, or uh, should they initiate an antiviral agent so my thank you again a very good question my answer to that is pretty similar to the previous one the rt pcr has so much limitations and i would tell you this that we are in india we are lucky to have it even in 2 to 3 days time in some parts of the world and in some centers even the us the result comes after one week so that apart from the lack of sensitivity the delay in giving the reply is a major problem so therefore uh i think we would go by the clinical condition so to answer this specific question again uh let the rt pcr take its time it's very helpful if you get it but i would give the patient uh the treatment based on the clinical f- features of the patient so now i think we're beginning to understand a few things when these patients come to us with symptoms or a ct scan just one of the indicators is there but the other indicator which rt pcr is not there then one new thing that i am now uh, not new i mean i'm sure others are doing it but what i am now doing is sending their uh, blood tests so then if the blood test like il6 is high or the d dimer is high or the serum ferritin is high now i can make my diagnosis with a reasonable more certainty so what are the pillars of the diagnosis clinical condition clinical that means fever body ache loss of smell if this patient has loss of smell loss of taste i know it is the virus no nothing else causes it is very specific 
So clinical context, clinical condition is important. Clinical context is another pillar. RT PCR is a third pillar. CT scan is a fourth pillar, and lab tests are the fifth pillar. Then you take a combined view of all of these, and that gives you the decision. And with that age, now the same thing. Now I have a family yesterday I was treating, where the husband and wife are about. 50 the their children are about 20 the mother is 80 so all of them have fever i think one or two are positive i'm giving the drug to the mother because i don't want her to progress the husband has is 60 and has diabetes so i'm giving him the drug the wife is 55 has no comorbidities and the children are okay. So they are not being given the drug at all. So therefore, I think if you begin to understand who is your high-risk patient, I think you can then prevent the progression and cover this patient aggressively early in the disease. So that's something I'm doing. I want to also warn my patients, because just yesterday we had, we have had a couple of patients whom CT scan, and unfortunately sometimes CT scan doctors are very aggressive. The CT scan is said compatible with the clinical diagnosis of COVID. And they had, one of them had a heart attack and heart failure and those interstitial septal thickenings and GGO was pulmonary edema. Another had a non-COVID virus. Third had a standard atypical bacterial pneumonia. So no single test is 100%, and that is how we know it. That is the beauty of medicine. But you take a combined uh, overview, I think you will you will be right most of the time. I hope that helps you. One, one another interesting question. This is regarding the disease uh, processor. So uh, uh, it, it appears that females are less affected and also in terms of severity are doing quite well. Is there any particular reason for that? I think this this virus is a female, so it has got a, a no, no. Okay, I, I jokes aside. Okay, no, I the, so nobody really knows the answer to that. And you're right, this has been seen all over the world. One of the theories, okay, so don't uh, hold me to it, because when there is no confirmatory proof, then everybody has a theory. One theory that I heard from an endocrinologist is that because males have more testosterone. And that testosterone drives the expression of ACE receptors uh, on the cell. That increases the binding of the cell to... Uh, so males have more ACE uh, receptors, more binding, and therefore a more aggressive viral attack. I'm not sure that that is the answer, but that is something that somebody said. Because if that was the case, then older people, where the... As the, as the human beings like 90 have much lower testosterone, the 90s would not be so affected. But that's just one of the theories. Take it for whatever it is worth. Uh, if you don't agree with me, then that's fine. I also have to say I don't have a good answer. But that's the best I have so far. Fair enough. Sir. So uh, another question, sir, is, is regarding... Uh... Uh, again, uh, favipiravir treatment that uh, doctor is uh, telling that they have started it early, but even after day five, the IL-6 is elevated and there is a mild uh, elevation in D-dimer and CRP. So when do you start uh, getting a clinical and uh, you know laboratory improvement in patients started on favipiravir? Yeah. So if you start the drug, it's... It takes a few days, and you saw the earlier uh, the data from the Japanese observational study that you would see between seven and fourteen days the improvement. So day five is early, but I would also like to bring to your attention that if your patient is yet running fever, is yet having elevation and enzymes, the question is: they were seventy, they are yet seventy, or they were seventy now they are five hundred. So if they were at 70 and they're yet at 70, you're fine. Just continue the drug. But if they were 50, 70 and went to 400, 500, then you might like to keep in mind that this patient is going into a cytokine storm. 
So you'd like to cover the patient for that cytokine storm with appropriate therapy, whatever you may be using in your context, ito, uh, tosi, or steroids or whatever. But keep in mind that if your patient is not responding, you have to keep in mind the cytokine storm. Uh, next question is regarding the the safety aspect again, sir. So how do you uh, monitor serum uric acid level and uh, uh, what do you do if, if it raises? Okay, good questions again. What do we do is, uh, we I do, uh, so in the asymptomatic patient, I usually don't run a blood test. Uh, I would probably, maybe if I'm doing some other tests, then I would do, uh, uric acid and LFT, mainly SGOT, SGPT, uh, on the seventh day. Usually I'm doing some other tests, so I would do it. If your patient is completely asymptomatic, uh, then I'm not even sure you want to do any tests. However, in the symptomatic patient, I would get liver enzymes and uric acid levels done. And if they are high, then I have only one option. I stop the drug. I mean, there's no point continuing the drug and then giving Febixostat. I would just stop the drug if there is elevation of liver enzymes or elevation of uric acid. And it takes a few days for them to come back to normal. So don't expect that it will go away within the next three days or so. It takes a week or 10 days for uh, everything to settle down. So uh, this next question by Dr. Avinash. I hope you answered this sir, in, in your previous uh, discussion. But having said that, uh, uh, do you start this drug on every patient who is tested positive and is at home quarantine? Or would you stratify and only start in patients who are maybe elderly and having comorbidities? Correct. I think we've answered that in part in the earlier uh, talk. I would not give it to everybody. I would give it to the more severe patient and the more high-risk patient. So I had given the example. We had this family uh, where the parents were 80, the children were 55, 60, and the grandchildren were 20s. So the grandchildren didn't get anything. The husband who was 60 and had diabetes, I would give it. Uh, the elderly, any way I gave because they were uh, 80. So you can use it kind of like prophylaxis, you know, like a vaccine, post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, but if that younger lady who's 55 had no comorbidities, but was showing a fever, then she would also get it. So I think you've got to stratify based on the uh, clinical context of the patient and the clinical context, whether the patient is febrile or not. She may be the index case, you know, 55 and has fever, but no comorbidities. She'll get it. Okay. So th there is uh, one more question uh, regarding the use in pediatric uh, population. So uh, before I, I hand over to you, sir, I would like to... Uh, communicate that the drug is approved only in adult 18 and above age group. Uh, but then, sir, how do you manage a, a pediatric patient with COVID-19, if I may put so? Good question. My simple answer is I don't manage. So I'm an adult uh, doctor. I am not a pediatrician. Uh, I have not uh, seen too many patients. Yes, once in a while we see a few patients. In fact, we've seen quite a few pregnant ladies uh, which I have been fortunate to have had a very easy time in managing. Uh, just give them for cough, inhaler, salbutamol, for any nasal symptoms, because that's all they had, a uh, little bit of antihistaminics. And I was very fortunate that we were able to avoid everything. I could use steroids in a couple of them who had fever. I would definitely not, I, I, you know, we would keep everything else low, but definitely not use VP Ravir because of teratogenic effect. So in pregnancy, in children, uh, I've spoken to my pediatric colleagues. I think most of the kids' infections are mild. I don't know how they watch out for the clotting syndrome or the Kawasaki syndrome. I'm sure they treat that with, uh, you know, steroids. But again, I'm not the right person to answer that question. There are uh, a couple of questions regarding some some of the experimental drugs which with with potential anti-COVID effect. So, any comment on maybe ivermectin? 
थोड़ी देर में फोन करना थोड़ी वेट ओके सो एनी अदर ड्रग आई टेक देम टूगेदर ओनली आई वेक्टिन Uh, I were making there is some French drug uh, amitrine. So, so one of the question is on amitrine. One is on I were making. So any other things are outside these approved drugs which you feel. No. Is... So the thing is that uh, I have. Uh, I mean, do I put it? It is in our hospital protocol. I think it came with the ICMR protocol. We give it. Do I believe in it? And the answer is absolutely strictly no. Uh, it's not being used rest of the world. The only people who approved it was a Dhaka trial. and uh, i really don't know how robust the trial was what was every uh, thing in it and it doesn't make scientific sense to me but then you never know so i don't think i should be dogmatic about it uh do i use it yes do i believe in it no the random studies that got you know out of uh, hand uh i don't know but uh, there are other drugs that are being considered repurposing old drugs like nifemostat is being uh, tried not yet approved uh there is a drug yesterday combination drug combination i think we saw with roche is doing with uh, interferon beta uh, and another combination so a lot of trials are going on but i am not uh, sure of any drug that has other than Fabipiravir that has been approved. I'm sure there'll be other drugs that uh, come out, but not yet. No. So maybe one final question, sir, because there are many questions, but there are repetitions. So, uh, yeah, any comment on anticoagulant use? Another very important point. Yes, I, for one, having seen so many cardiac events in my patients. i'm very aggressive in use of anticoagulants um you know i have to tell that it, it is not fair for me to generalize for everybody because i'm a hospital based doctor so most of my patients are severe and serious 100% of my patients are put on as soon as they walk in they are put on either an oral or a injectable uh anti clotting factor so they either go on low molecular heparin or they will go on a noag another thing that i do because as you mentioned as you remember in my earlier in my talk i said it affects both the arterioles and the venules so i also give them uh, a low dose aspirin so nearly 100% of my hospitalized patients are on low dose uh, you know aspirin and uh blood thinner anti clot drug so whether it is oral or injectable now what about the non hospitalized patients here i do a risk stratification if it's elderly i would do it i'll give them an oral drug or injectable a plus uh, aspirin my whole dilemma is in the younger people so if a person is 40 and below has just had uh, a diagnosis then i really don't know whether i'm justified in giving that but then i go by the blood test if i find on the blood test that the d dimer is high or there is elevation of say il6 or serum ferritin showing this inflammation in this patient then i again give them anticoagulants okay anticoagulants and antiplatelets both and the duration is between 4 to 6 weeks i give them at least 4 weeks if the patient has been having a severe illness in the hospital then 6 weeks hmm. i hope that helps you yeah uh, one one final question sir i think this is important so uh, the question is that many uh, clinicians are giving fevipiravir for 5 to 7 days so do you agree with such dosing regimen so what you want to do is make the patient well you saw that a very mild patients about 70% will get well in one week's time then i think that's fair enough at the end of one week if the mild patient is okay then i can stop it but those who are moderate definitely those who are severe uh 
I would give it for 14 days, not more. But in such patients, especially those who have been symptomatic, uh, then I would push for a longer duration. But a very mild case became normal in two days' time. I can stop it in seven days. Oh, fair enough. So I, uh, we have completed, uh, we have answered, I think you have answered all the questions where, uh, I mean, considering the repetitions and the, the things which are covered in lecture. So thank you so much, sir, uh, for, for being a part of this uh, uh, educational uh, meeting for us. And uh, uh, really privileged to have you. There was an excellent lecture followed by, you know, a very interactive uh, Q&A session. So thank you so much, sir. And uh, any closing thank remarks? You. Thank you for arranging this. And I want to thank the audience for their participation. Uh, it is a pleasure. And some of the questions are out of syllabus, sir, by the way. <laughs> but <laughs> I agree. it's a pleasure. I loved it. Uh, thank you. It was, it was very interactive. I enjoyed it. Uh, Rohit, thank you. Thank you, sir. So thank you all for, for joining us on a Friday evening and, and being a part of this uh, national uh, symposium on, on a role of Ivy in COVID-19. Uh, a goodbye and take care. Bye. Okay. Talk to you later, Rohit. So okay, sir. Done. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, can we go offline? Yes, sir. Sure. Shall I end the meeting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.